Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of the LRM Online podcast. Uh, I am here today with a a very special guest. Uh, you may have played one of the games from his studio, Sabotage Studio, uh, The Messenger. Uh, well, they have a brand new game that's going to be coming out in a couple of years, and it is a turn-based RPG inspired by the likes of Chrono Trigger. And I am privileged enough to be here today with President and Creative Director of Sabotage, Thierry Bollinger. Hi, Thierry. How are you? Hey, I'm good. It's good to talk to you. How are you doing? I'm great. I couldn't be more excited to talk about this. Uh, the second that this game popped up on my radar, it came through a Facebook ad. And um, I saw, okay, Chrono Trigger. Obviously, that's a big that's a big game for us you know, RPG fans. And the second I saw it, I was like, all right, that's, that's some bold statement here. Let's take a look exactly as to what it is. And then I, I went to your Kickstarter page, which has already long surpassed its 94,000, uh, at least USD, mm-hmm. US dollar mm-hmm. goal, and is, is knocking on $500,000 at this point, which is fantastic. Congratulations on that. Um, you guys don't even have any current stretch goals yet for where you guys are going as far as the finances go. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing how, how high this thing goes. Um, but... I was very impressed uh, for a myriad of reasons, but I the first thing I was impressed by was sort of the, the art direction you guys decided to go with, because when I see people talking about Chrono Trigger inspired, it's a lot of times it's, yeah, Chrono Trigger inspired, but, you know, it still has its own, uh, like a, a very, like, a usually 3D sort of aesthetic. My mind goes to mm-hmm. uh, studios like Tokyo RPG Factory, where mm-hmm. they had, like, I Am right. Setsuna and Lost Fear, where it's still kind of trying to be a little bit modern but you fully embrace the retro angle so at what point did you set, decide you were going to go with the pixel art as opposed to 3d cg type stuff mm-hmm. well uh, these are good examples uh you know the more modern ones that you you mentioned it's kind of like they have the retro game design and gameplay and then the modernized uh art direction for us it's it's 100 percent the opposite you know mm-hmm. so we're going in terms of audio and visuals uh, we want to belong to sort of like late '90s, and you know, in terms of where emotionally where where it's at. But then, in terms of game design and and gameplay and and storytelling and all of that, that that's where we modernize. Of course, we add a few a few things in there that you would not have seen uh, on those retro consoles, you know, such as like dynamic lighting and whatnot. But we we definitely want this to open this uh, nostalgia box, you know. So, what do you think it is? That uh, what are those main core aspects that you want to capture from the '90s? Like when someone says, you know, '90s. RPG or something. What are those those key elements that you think make something a '90s RPG? There's something about the 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 wow. That's that's a big one. It could be yeah, it's a big one. There's a lot to unpack there. Down, but there's certainly something there about the the. It's the kind of of uh, experience that could only emerge from from really harsh limitations. You know, mm-hmm. um, first going from pixel art, it's kind of it's a way of looking at a character and 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 bonding with them in a way that that you just don't don't get anymore. You know, the sprites have something inherently, uh, you know, cute and and, and that, that you want to to be attached to. You know, uh, and so we're trying to to in this sense we're trying to connect to this simplicity. You know, it's not like a, a overly long cinematic intros. You know, and then music that is more of a score. You know, it's like no, it gets to the point right away with catchy bits. You know, so all of that it's kind of the idea is to is to distill instead of of dilute, if that makes sense. And by keeping this simple, we are, we can't really get lost. You know, in, in in lengthy bits that 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 don't that don't really bring anything or, or that can often bring tedium. You know, by keeping it simple, we have to focus on moment to moment gameplay. Right. So uh, you're coming off of The Messenger, which was a very critically uh, critically acclaimed game that came out, uh, but it doesn't really resemble this in any way, shape, or form. Yes, I believe it's set in the same world, correct? It's like a... In the, right. It's a prequel story, as you say in your, your video. However, very different game mechanics. How long did it take for you guys, coming off of that project, to decide you wanted to go into a, a turn-based RPG, which is a huge departure? It was actually pitched... Uh, so everyone who's uh, who's been... So for me, this fantasy world has been building since I was in elementary school. You know, So all those, those characters and, and big story arcs. And, and so it's kind of like bringing these things to life and then which game genres fit perfectly the story or, or best the, the story that we'll be telling in case of messenger it's a it's a solo protagonist going from point a to point b you know basically so the side scroller action platformer was, was was good for that now sea of stars is about a group of adventurers sailing around the world and unraveling mysteries so it's more about you know taking your time in that adventure so the turn-based rpg is is it's kind of a better fit there for the story right um 
first the studio goes everybody knew we were going to make an rpg uh, it was the project we were everyone who joined the studio was the most excited about uh, it just happened messenger just happened to be a sort of a a, a not necessarily simpler because game dev is always you know a, a its own challenge but it was something we could get traction on more easily with a smaller team as we slowly ramped up you know to the the full the full staff, if you will, you know. Uh, so now all 16 of us are there. It's kind of like the, the the definitive edition of the team. It's the final vision that we have. So now we have, you know, the the, the resources that we need to to undertake a project that's kind of bigger. And also, we hopefully built some trust with with uh, our fan base that now they can believe that we can tackle these more complex, you know, systems and that we'll be delivering because we showed the attention to detail and, and a promise of quality and polish, you know, that, that on everything that we touch, that's the one thing we'll never compromise on, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so as far as pitching it to the team, uh, to, to fully answer that, that question, it was pitched. It was first, the first complete pitch was in October, 2018. So that was, I think two or three months after we released the messenger, mm-hmm. um, we just had a summit, you know, remote uh, place for a week and everyone just like kind of chilling together. And it was like, okay, everyone, here's the, here's the next thing. So it was, I pitched uh, during that, that event, I pitched uh, the messenger DLC picnic panic and then also sea of stars. And so it was like, okay, so here's what we'll do. We're doing this DLC and then the RPG, you know, unless we choose to do more DLCs and but then, then it was based more on uh, who was excited about what. And, and there was an overwhelming uh, hype internally to kind of, get cracking on the RPG, so we started doing that. At what stage did you realize that you would have combat on the current screen, like Chrono Trigger status? But I was always there. Yeah, always yeah. there. So, oh yeah, it's something that was a letdown in every single game after I played that one. You know? Yeah, it is interesting how uh, you have a lot of those games that are sort of inspired by it. I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, or at least very many of them, where they actually do the same sort of thing where you hit an enemy and then they, everyone kind of arranges themselves on a screen and then sort of a battle menu pops up and you, you jump mm-hmm. right into it. Seeing that was kind of one of the big selling points when I saw your video. I was like, "Oh, they're fully embracing. They're going right into that." I thought that was cool. Mm. Right, I, I'd say uh, probably Cosmic Star Heron was one that 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 the uh, you know would would be uh, it was compared to it in, in some fashion, and it was pixel art, and it had that sort of uh, more seamless combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's true. Like it's very rare, you know. Because uh, and I think perhaps part of it is you want your navigation to feel really organic, and you don't want to end up in this like, oh, this looks like a battle arena. So of course there's combat. You don't want something where it's like straight lines and then big squares, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of blending all of that is is certainly its own its own challenge in terms of level design. But uh, it's the world we want to build. So, what can you tell us about the battle system that you guys created for this game? Well, it's it's. Uh, I mean, so the first thing is 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 very much to have it uh, kind of seamless. I think is it's getting memed a little bit how how often I use this word now, <laughs> but yeah. uh, you know this idea that there's no transition, there's no loading, it's not a separate you know battlefield. It's it's exactly where you are navigating. Mm-hmm. But then also the reason why it's uh, turn based instead of you know having time bars uh, is that time bars would conflict with the idea of timing your input. If you think of Mario RPG or Paper Mario or the Mario and Luigi games, uh, that that as the animation is playing, if you press at the right moment, you increase the damage you deal or or you can block, you know, an enemy attack, you can reduce damage, I mean. Um, but but so that would conflict with another bar is full, so the menu pops up for that character, but you're just trying to do the input for your attack, and then it, it's it's having you select attack for someone else or whatever. So the idea is, is really like no, you focus. You know, you get to um, it's 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 far from being a, a tactical RPG, but still, you know, kind of like this this vibe of uh, when it's your turn, you can you can fully take your time, you can think things through, you can you know go through all your special skills and 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 look at the the info cards on all the enemies and, and choose the perfect move, you know, and plan out all your stuff instead of always being rushed of you'll be missing out as they're auto attacking you, you know? Right. So you had a big announcement this morning as of recording, we're recording this on April 7th, the morning of April 7th. And, uh, welcome to some interesting news that you guys had landed Yasunori Mitsuda. Well, one of the yeah. original composers for Chrono Trigger, mm-hmm. basically bringing this whole sort of project full circle. It seems like, how did that happen? I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's uh, it's hard to describe. You know, it's it's uh, you know this thing where like uh, 
aim for the moon and worst case, you know, and it's like, well, I guess, I guess we just didn't miss it. It's, it's we tried, it was a very long shot, you know, uh, and we tried very tentatively, you know, and, and we've been asking for, I think the first time we asked someone was three years ago. Wow. Cause there are people, you know, uh, uh uh, who, who their work is, they're kind of, you know, they're talent agents and, they, and they'll try to be linking, you know, uh, the, the West with, you know, Asia and whatnot. And, and, you know, there's all this sort of, and it's like, wait, can we have this guy though? And it's, and, and it's always like, eh, you know, oof, that's a, and all we got always was, was, that's really a long shot, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so we just, you know, we just, uh, kept at it and, and eventually it was just, you know, reaching out and asking politely and letting the game, uh, speak for itself, you know, because from just the idea on paper, you know, uh, I can't imagine what it's like to be, you know, someone of this, of this status, but like, you would assume that they, that it's, it's the kind of, of interactions that they get all the time, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, Hey, you don't understand. I'm doing this for a living because I was inspired by your work. You know, will you, will you write music for, for our project? And it's like, eh, you know, why this one or, or whatever. So, um, but no, I guess there was something in there that that he, just, he that he felt was genuine enough that he, he wanted to get involved, in. and and that's also a sentiment we got from him. I don't know if you saw his his uh, mm -hmm. sort of like official quote, um, but yeah, he felt compelled, like he felt like he had to contribute to uh, the project. So I, I think you know it's not so much about uh, you know reaching out just business for hey, are you looking for work? It's like of course he's not looking for work, you know, but he's looking to work on something that he genuinely cares to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really hard to pinpoint, you know, how we we kind of pull this off because he, it just came down to he looked at it and, and, and said yes because he he felt it, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you know how he will be contributing with your, your other composer, uh, Eric C. Brown, how that's going to work, the dynamic? Eric W. Brown, yeah. W. Brown, uh, so sorry, well, Eric W. Brown. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, well, so he's... Um, I mean, so for sure, we, he's more of a guest composer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because Eric is our, you know, go-to guy and, and full-time in-house composer. Um, but it's, so we're, we're looking at, at different options, you know, the, the game has many islands, so perhaps uh, one island could be all Mitsuda, you know, uh, or perhaps, you know, we could contribute to, to different little bits of the game. Um, it's also that he has some very interesting uh, options, you know. Uh, he, perhaps it could be a band, perhaps he could be an orchestra, you know. So it can really go anywhere. So we're we're we're, we're kind of at this point just excited to be working together, you know, from both sides, uh, and we're kind of just figuring out, you know, what the options are. Uh, we we want this to be, you know, what, what feels truly right, and we understand, we know what our game looks like, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, and we understand the kind of emotion it created in and the growing fan base. So we definitely want to deliver on that. Right, right. So now I guess we're kind of going backwards on this. What can you tell us about the overall story for Sea of Stars and the main characters that we'll be controlling? Right, well, so it's it's, um, it's a world where, it's a world where uh, the, the two, uh, two immortal alchemists had a, a falling out, basically. Uh, and they, so they set out to create the elixir of life and they succeeded. So they became immortal, right? Uh, and it became kind of boring after a while. Uh, what happened is that their flesh kept on decaying. So they looked like, you know, dried up mummies. Uh, so now they wear colorful robes to conceal their hideous appearances. Um, and so basically one of those two, after, you know, thousands of years of, of immortality, uh, got bored and decided to set out to kind of regain this uh, physical youth, if you will. Mm -hmm. And started performing, you know, alchemy on, on flesh and bone and soul and... and and blood and the other one was kind of like, hey, you should stop this. You know, it's kind of evil what you're doing. And eventually he emerged as, you know, the Fleshmans are this evil entity that's like, you know, I'll cause whatever pain I need to as I do research and development on, on, on the on the all life forms. And so basically they've had this fight going on forever. And now the world is kind of in this aftermath of there's, you know, giant constructions and then scars everywhere and, and certain cities that are no go zones for this or that clan because the, the sort of the aftermath or the, the, the collateral damage of, of their uh, never-ending fight is, is kind of visible everywhere. Um, and so you have the Flesh Monster on the one side who is creating monsters who, if they feed long enough, they will emerge as a world eater, which is kind of like a monster that would, it would be the apocalypse, it would destroy everything. And on the other side, you have the children of the solstice who fight for the good alchemist. And when they're born on the summer or winter solstice, they get the power of the sun or moon. And then that magic combines to eclipse magic. And it's the, the one thing that can, you know, destroy the flesh creations. 
Um, and so there's a legend that says that two solstice warriors could emerge as a guardian gods and then they would be invincible. And so whether whether there will be a world eater first or a guardian gods first de- determines, you know, the fate um, of the world, essentially. And so we're playing two characters who are born on the same year uh, and they want one summer, one winter. And they go on, their, on this quest together and they're uh, going through solstice warrior training and they're patrolling the world and they're kind of like assessing, you know, the the, the Fleshmancers, monsters, and they're answering to their order. And, and they always have these uh, meetings at every eclipse. They need to take down a specifically, you know, um, uh, threatening monster that's about to morph or evolve or whatever. And they, so they try to take them down. So they kind of have those meetings every time there's uh, a special eclipse event. So that's the basic setting where we're, you know, in a long line of those warriors and uh, just doing going about our days, you know, and uh, obviously the, sk- the stakes get higher because we do play two very important uh, Solstice Warriors there. Right, right. How does the, um, the abilities of the Solstice Warrior play into the uh, the battle system? Like, do they each have their own unique skill set? How does that work? Uh, yes, they do. So, I mean, so regular attacks are, are you know, what they are. They just look different. They have uh, diff- each their own uh, weapons. In terms of special uh, skills, it's so one will have moon magic, the other one will have sun magic, you know, and then that can play into enemy uh, uh, resistances or weaknesses, right? Mm-hmm. So a certain enemy would be, you know, could be impervious to sun magic or very vulnerable to moon magic and things like that. So you you'll be it's very much, you know, without without doing the classic uh, fire, water, earth, and air, you know, th- right. there's still this kind of uh, rock, paper, scissors uh, of of re- resistances and and bonuses mm-hmm. going on. Right. So I have so many things to say about this game in terms of just how it looks and how, how seamless, seamless, I said it this time, how seamless it all, all kind right. of blends together. Um, what would you say if you were to point to either one feature or one sort of, uh, I don't know, technological type breakthrough that you guys do, would you say is like the most exciting aspect of this project so far? I think really traversal is like, just running around the game, it, it's it's a bit harder to convey because controls are something you need to actually feel, you know, but we're, we're very much putting the platformer experience to use, you know, here. Uh, the fact that you can, you know, you, you enter a cavern and, and there's no loading, it just fades it fades out and then back in and you're in the cavern, you, you start hiking, you just jump, climb up, you come out, you fight enemies and then you just jump out next to the entrance, you know. Mm-hmm. So all, all these moments where oh, you want to go down there, you got to find the stairs or the ladder. No, you just jump off or, or those moments where you're done with a side area and then you need to walk back, you know. It's like, no, no, you just jump off. So we're always having these points, you know, or uh, even unlocking shortcuts, you know, things like, oh, it's kind of a hike, but then you kick a uh, rope ladder down. So then it's, yeah, then you know, you get the, these these shortcuts and, and all of that. That's definitely something we're trying to bring and, and we're careful with the term, uh, metroidvania because it, it caused a bit of a debate about messenger whether or not it, it was legit one or not which i don't even know that it was but um but so without necessarily using the term there's definitely uh this concept of you'll be seeing a place you can't reach in an early dungeon and then later on you get a traversal upgrade you know and then if you make the connection oh i can now go back to this early dungeon and now i'll be able to get to this place and then there's a special chest that that's good for very later in the game by the time you can get to that you know uh so all of that all of the, these elements are are in there for sure cool cool all right now getting a, just a little more personal what would you say for you is maybe the single most influential video game you played growing up a chrono trigger for sure just chrono, oh besides chrono trigger that's an easy one besides chrono trigger yeah. Well, I mean, besides, I mean, you know, besides the reason why I make this for a living, you know, yeah, uh, well, besides that, uh, you know, passion aside, no, um, I mean, this it's kind of like after the number one, there's a lot of empty space, mm-hmm. and then there's a lot of them, you know, uh, so Ninja Gaiden was a, was mm. a, a huge one, Ninja Gaiden 2 specifically, right? Um, uh, Monkey Island, oh wow, yeah, yeah, Monkey, Monkey Island was huge. Uh, as as some could tell by the the bit of the writing there, um, I mean I other you know the, the thing is the short answer is all of them because all I did I did nothing but play games you know uh, Illusion of Gaia is, is a very big one uh, Suikoden two definitely uh, Lufia second one again um, Breath of Fire mm. I mean you know but even even more recent uh, you know Mass Effect. 
Aspect 2 specifically, I don't know what it is with, with second uh, with sequels, but Donkey Kong Country 2 as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, lot, all yeah. those, it's a lot of stuff to work through. A lot of retro titles for sure, you know. Uh, yeah. So, not to uh, jump ahead too far, but what would you, um, what other genres would you like to tackle in the future? Hmm. Well, I mean, which ones I would like to tackle, so not necessarily which one we will be tackling, or I mean, it could be it could be either or. It could be either or. Yeah, because right. I mean, everything would be fun to tackle to some degree, like because the treatment uh, what we do is we try to preserve what aged well and we rethink what what didn't to modernize those experiences and try to like bring to give give a reminder to those who miss those games how how great they could be without you know the stiff controls or the repetitive music sometimes and things like that so th- there's many genres we could do that to um the point and click adventure would would be oh, would wow. be a fun one i think yeah 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 that'd be cool to uh, see nowadays i haven't played one of those in what decade is it <laughs> <laughs> like i don't and, know yeah and even even you know um even sports game if they were like more arcade style i'm thinking of you know a, a kings of the beach you know volleyball game on nes things like that those were those were so so great you know um but yeah no i mean anything really perhaps not just not a fps it's not something that we were were so much into you know right not that i didn't play doom eternal but it's just not something that i uh, sort of understand enough or, 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 or felt enough things I wish were done differently as I played them. You know? Sure. Uh, is there anything else that you would like uh, anyone out there listening, any of your Kickstarter supporters about the game that you would like to share before we, uh, before we call it? Well, I mean, I, yeah, all we have to say at this point is, is thank you so much. You know, it's, it's, uh, we got way further and way faster than, than we thought we would. So it, it kind of got bigger than us. So we're still kind of, we're not exactly backed up, but like we're still figuring out, you know, how to best deal with all of that. And, and we don't want to make it bigger just because we can, you know, we, we actually, we feel like we have what we needed out of it. So uh, we're just absolutely thankful. The one thing we did underestimate is, is um, the social media goals. We wanted to reveal new characters, you know, on certain milestone. And it, it turned out the camping did, you know, 10 times better than we thought. And then the social media people don't really care and that's fine. But it's just, we're kind of eager to reveal the, the, a third uh, playable character. So we might actually do that even though we haven't reached the goal for it. Oh, cool. Cool, cool. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on here. I hope you're all staying safe during, you know, this very, very uh, trying time. And that, uh, yeah, like if you, I certainly can't wait to play this game. Like I am over the moon and it's a shame that we're like, what, two years away from this thing coming out at this point, which yeah. is, you know, quality takes time and I'm happy you guys have what you need, the resources. So I'll, I'm just thrilled. So congratulations and best of luck to you. Thanks so much. Have a good day. You too.